Satan offers shortcuts and substitutions. I like that. But frequently enough that uh, even though well, I they are for not some reason with the show of hands, I, they just I don't continue really... to say the same thing. Later, people marvel that they can do such a thing, but the Bible has an explanation for that. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaks expressly, uh, and it says, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving uh, spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. That is to say, they know it's a lie when they tell it. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, you can pervert your conscience. You can sear your conscience so that it has no effect upon you whatsoever. That can be done. And in the context here, it involves false teachers who can look their brethren right in the eye and tell them uh, uh, that the Bible means something different than what it obviously means. And they can uh, say it convincingly, they can say it sincerely. But they know they're lying, and they know they're teaching that which is false. In the first century, the apostles and elders met in Jerusalem, for example, in Acts chapter 15. And they determined that Gentile Christians did not need to be circumcised, as some of the Judaizing teachers were claiming. They also determined that... Uh, Brethren, Christians, did not need to keep the law of Moses except the four things that were mentioned in the letter that they wrote to brethren. But did that put an end to the teaching of the Judaizing teachers? Well, some of them, but not all of them, Knowing of the decision that had been made by the apostles and elders, they would still go out and preach that same false gospel. They knew better. They had seared their consciences. Another example. Had uh, Jesus not thoroughly defeated the theology of the Sadducees who did not believe in angels or in the resurrection? How is it that more than 25 years later, some were teaching in Corinth that there would be no resurrection from the dead? Paul responds by, first of all, pointing out that the resurrection of Jesus is a fundamental part of the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Jesus died and was buried and rose again. That's part, heart even, of the gospel message. Then Paul goes on to list several who saw the resurrected Christ, including himself, verses 5 through 11. Then Paul begins his application. Since Christ is raised from the dead, how is it that some of you say there is no resurrection? And after making several arguments proving the reality of the resurrection, Paul talks about the day when Christians shall be raised from the dead, having become victorious over death. And that's in verses 13 through 57. How could some have brought themselves into speaking contrary to the truth? They had seared their consciences. They had distorted the truth. Now, distorting the truth is not the only moral evil that people can commit. How can murderers such as Queen Jezebel not be bothered by the actions they commit? Or how could those who live in fornication or persist in unauthorized marriage actually convince themselves that they're not doing anything wrong. And yet, they do. People have learned to justify every sin imaginable by searing their consciences. But those individuals are not the subject of our study this morning. 
faithful Christians will fervently desire to never reach such a condition. With careful preparation, we can all avoid such an error in our lives, especially if we begin when we are young. If we do that, we will better be able to establish the proper attitudes and strategies. So let's begin by asking this morning, what is the conscience? The King James, the New King James, and the American Standard have no renderings of conscience in the Old Testament. The New American Standard, the Revised Standard, and the English Standard Version have one verse that they use conscience in in the Old Testament. The New uh, International, which tends to be uh, loose and almost a paraphrase at times, uh, has six times where they use the word conscience in the Old Testament. Now, comments are made about that in the book. We haven't got time to cover uh, all of that, and they're not uh, go going to look at some of the more technical things. But suffice it to say that even though the word is uh, not mentioned or barely mentioned so that a few translations put it in there, the concept is there. Even though there's no word particularly for it, the concept is there. And we know that it is there by looking at and observing Adam and Eve. God gave them the commandment. And he told them that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which they did. And what was their response? They felt guilty. They may have felt shame. They went and hid. Why? Because God had created them with a conscience. And it told them, you have done wrong. All of us are born with a conscience. But some learn to sear it. And possibly at a very early age. But it is there. Now in the New Testament, the Greek word, sunedesis, appears in the Greek text 32 times. And in the King James, it is translated conscience every single time. In addition, there is no other Greek word that is translated conscience uh, so far as I was able to find. But let's take a look at a few of these, and I think uh, most of these verses you will be familiar with. Let's begin with John chapter 8 and verse 9, which I believe is the first time it's mentioned. John chapter 8 and verse 9. This uh, involves the uh, woman who was brought, uh, who had committed adultery, was brought before Jesus. And uh, Jesus had told them, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. We read in verse 9, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. So their conscience told them, you are not free from sin. You have committed sin. Let's go next to Acts chapter 23 and verse uh, 1. We're going to come back to this a little bit later. But in Acts chapter 23 and, and verse 1, as Paul is making a defense of himself uh, and his actions... He looked at earnestly at the council and said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Uh, look at Acts 24 and verse 16. This being so, I also myself strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Uh, Romans chapter 2 and uh, verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves and their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. That's an important verse, by the way. The conscience either accuses you or it says you're okay. It excuses you. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, verse 12. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Next, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1 and verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. We know from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9 that those uh, who are uh, qualified for elders, although this is a set of deacons here, uh, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. And then uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. And uh, then finally, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. We out, no, we didn't do all 32. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. I think you'll recall this one. There is also an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. Not the removal of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the uh, conscience has a, a good function, a, a negative one in condemnation, but a, a positive one in justification of the individual. So to summarize briefly, the conscience accuses, tries, and convicts a person when he violates what he has been taught. It is possible to live with a good conscience, but it can also be defiled. Encouraging someone else to violate his conscience is a sin against Christ. Obeying what Jesus taught provides an individual a good conscience, which is and which results in peace of mind. Now, having looked at the scriptures, let's look at a few definitions given to us by uh, those who define these words strong defines the Greek word sunedesis as, first, the consciousness. Nothing, we'll get to conscience in a little bit with this definition. But first, there is a consciousness. You have to realize something. The consciousness of anything. And second, the soul as distinguishing between what is morally good and bad, prompting us to do the former and shunning the latter, commending one, condemning the other. And that's all from uh, Strong. Uh, A.T. Robertson says that uh, the word translated conscience is literally joint knowledge in Greek. Latin, conscientia, and English, conscience, which comes from the Latin. It is a late word from sunoida, to know, which means to know together. In itself, the word means consciousness of one's own thoughts, as it is used in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 2, or of one's own self. Then, consciousness of the distinction between right and wrong, as we read uh, from Romans 2.15. And then with approval or disapproval. And that's uh, Robertson's definition. Vine says that the word sunedesis means literally a knowing with. From sun, meaning with, and oida, to know. To know with. A co-knowledge, in other words, with oneself. And then Vine adds these words, 
The witness born to one's conduct by conscience, that faculty by which we apprehend the will of God as that which is designed to govern our lives. Hence, the sense of guiltiness before God, Hebrews 10 to, that process of thought which distinguishes what it considers morally good or bad, commending the good, condemning the bad, and so prompting to do the former and avoid the latter. Well, these are uh, sources that have defined the word for us. Now we offer two conclusions concerning that. First, we all have a faculty that we call conscience. It is a function our mind has unless we sear it or defile it. It will operate properly and be to uh, our good. Our minds carefully consider what we have been taught concerning right and wrong and compare our actions with those ideals. If we know that stealing is wrong, yet for whatever reason we take something to which we're not entitled, our mind processes what we have been taught with the action of taking something that's not ours, and it accuses us, thief. We may try to justify ourselves, but our conscience has already condemned us. And we know internally that it is right. We may not want to hear it, but we know that it is right. If we succeed in defending our actions, even though we know we are wrong, we risk the valuable service that our conscience gives us, and we're, we're on the way to searing it or defiling it. Second, as our minds compare our actions with our beliefs, the conscience will also accuse us of failing to do what we ought to have done. Keeping in mind James chapter four and verse 17, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So if we had an opportunity to do a kindness for someone and we failed to act, we are likely going to hear about it from our conscience. If we passed up an opportunity to ask somebody from a, uh, for a Bible study, we will find ourselves at the end of the day being talked to by our conscience. You should have spoken to that person about a Bible study. And uh, so we will end the day asking for forgiveness and for an opportunity to do better the next day. There are some limitations, however, of the conscience. The conscience is one of the most valuable assets we have, but it is not foolproof. As powerful as it is in helping us to do what is right and to avoid what is wrong, it is not infallible. There are two things that can render this God-given tool ineffective. The first one we've already mentioned, searing it or defiling it. If we find ourselves defending actions that we know are wrong, we're headed in the wrong direction. Sometimes people will say things to themselves like, well, my employer doesn't pay me what I deserve. Therefore, I, I don't mind taking home a few tools or some products or supplies that I haven't paid for. That is, it hasn't been authorized by management. Some places will say you're allowed to take home this or that, but this is without permission. And we try to convince ourselves that such behavior is acceptable, even though we know that it's wrong. Another form of stealing is called in, in the common language, goofing off. If someone is being paid for work, he ought to be working. Otherwise, he is stealing the time and money of his employer. If we justify bad behavior, the conscience can be defeated. 
So there is that way of rendering the conscience useless. The second way is that the is this that makes it less than valuable, and that is that the conscience can only respond to what it knows. It can only respond to what it's been taught. If it's been taught wrong, it doesn't know it. Why is it that uh, so many women opt for abortions? They have never been taught that it is the taking of a human life. They have constantly heard it's been drummed into them from the time they were young, probably by the news media, probably by the entertainment media, that that's, that's not a human life, that's just tissue. It's just a fetus. Some women who later learn the truth now have to learn with a great, uh, live with a great amount of guilt in their lives. And uh, this, is, this is difficult. Similarly, if young people have been reared in a culture where fornication has become an obsolete word, their consciences are not going to bother them if they begin cohabitating with one another uh, without uh, even thinking that they will get married someday, not that if they did it would justify it, but even without any thought whatsoever. Although we are born with a conscience, we do not come with an innate sense of right and wrong. The mind only compares what we have been taught with the way we behave. God did not program us with perfect knowledge of right and wrong. He gave us a conscience, though, to deal with matters of right and wrong. We must be taught what is right and wrong from the word of God. To demonstrate this point, all anyone needs to do is examine the Apostle Paul. Remember what uh, we talked about earlier where he said that he had lived in all good conscience before God until the very day that he was addressing those Jews, Acts 23.1. That included the time where he persecuted Christians. Let's look at Acts chapter 26, <clears throat> verses 9 through 11. Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. Now, this covers the time period because he's relating his earlier life. So even though it appears after Acts 23... Uh, the events in Acts 26 happened before Acts 23. And uh, when he was living in all good conscience before God, here was his behavior. Beginning with Acts 26, 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do, must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I did in Jerusalem and many of the saints I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them to foreign cities. No inner voice told Saul of Tarsus that he was wrong for persecuting Christians. He did not violate anything that he had been taught throughout his life. In fact, since he and his friends believed that Jesus was a blasphemer and a pretender, it was the right thing to do to muster as much resistance to him as possible. Blasphemers, according to the law, were to be stoned. Deuteronomy 24, 16. And Saul believed he was a blasphemer. Therefore, Saul and others had no qualms about uh, putting Jesus to death or any of his followers, such as Stephen, to death. However, they had failed to properly consider the evidence concerning Jesus being the Son of God. 
Well, let's talk now about keeping the conscience clean. Robertson also noted that Saul followed what he believed. He commented, quote, but the conscience is not an infallible guide, but it acts according to the light that it has, 1 Corinthians 8, 7, and 10, 1 Peter 2, 19, end of quote. Since the conscience can only respond, therefore, to what it has been taught, it must be taught the truth. Paul was not troubled at all in his mind as he previously persecuted Christians. He could sleep at night just fine. He stood confidently in the law of Moses and in his rejection of Jesus. If he had heard the gospel preached, he didn't believe it. The claims of uh, Christianity, so far as he was concerned, were, were just lies. Once he was assured of the truth concerning Jesus, it changed everything. Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus. He had rejected the uh, testimony of those he might have heard preach. He had rejected the eyewitness testimony of Stephen as he was in the process of dying. Remember, Stephen said, Look, I see the heavens open. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, Acts 7 and verse 56. But then Saul spoke to Jesus directly. And Jesus convinced him that he was persecuting him. And what could Saul do? Say, no, even though I'm talking to you, I, I still don't believe you're raised from the dead. That would be a silly thing to try to convince oneself of. Saul was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, Acts 26, 19. And so he became a great preacher, an apostle, and uh, one of the uh, writers of crucial letters in the New Testament. However, before he could do that, Paul needed to know the truth. And then he could continue to live with a clear conscience. Therefore, in his preaching, Paul emphasizes truth and uses the word some 50 times in his letter. Let's just recall a few of these. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. In Galatians 4, 16, Paul asked the brethren the question, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 14, stand therefore, having your waist girded about with truth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and uh, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, you received it as uh, which you heard of us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works in you who believe. And uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. You know, sometimes you, you see people and uh, what they're believing and practicing is error, and it's sad, but they never receive the love of the truth, or they wouldn't be in that error. Love of truth is absolutely vital and critical to pleasing God. First Timothy chapter two, and verse 4, 
who desires, referring to God, uh, all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, these are just a few of the 50 times that Paul uses the word. These verses make it clear that truth is essential to salvation. If people could be saved by believing and practicing error, truth wouldn't matter. If people could be saved by practicing error, what, what value would truth have? We wouldn't need it. But not only is it crucial for salvation, it's also a requirement for the conscience to function properly. If truth is not firmly implanted in one's mind, how can the conscience do its job? How can it accuse or excuse? Nothing in Saul's mind could accuse him because the facts had not been stored up there when he was persecuting Christians. For this reason, several verses warn against error. Paul talks about those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1 and verse 18, many translations use suppress the truth in unrighteousness, which fits the thought of what follows because Paul also describes the Gentiles whom he confirms changed the truth of God into a lie, Romans 1.25. He describes men of corrupt mind who are destitute of the truth, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5. Other men who claimed that the resurrection was already past Paul affirms have concerning the truth have erred, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 18. And by the way, the followers of Max King are still saying the resurrection is already past. And they're in error too. And Brother uh, Denham is uh, negotiating for a debate with some of them. All Christians should be cautious not to to turn away from the truth, Titus 1 and verse 14. One reason for these warnings is that if Christians do not have a grasp of the truth, then their conscience cannot function the way God designed the conscience to function. Jesus himself taught that people must continue in his word in order to know the truth, John 8, 31 and 32. Solomon long ago, 3,000 years ago, in Proverbs 23, 23, said, Buy the truth and do not sell it. To know the word of God is imperative. And that knowledge has many applications. And some of these are found in uh, Psalm 119. Let's just notice a few passages there, or a few verses from Psalm 119. And in fact, I, I believe this is where uh, many of the verses from How Shall the Young Secure Their, Their Hearts come from. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to your word. The word of God provides the choicest rules that will keep the conscience clean. Uh, let's also notice uh, verse 11. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, verse 140. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. And so this is the way in which we are going to be able to guard our lives from sin. We want to be able to say as verse 130 of this psalm says, I have chosen the way of truth. We need the right heart. We need to understand the truth, but then we must, that's not sufficient in and of itself. We must have the right heart to accompany that. We, we must be wholehearted in our uh, dedication and devotion. Half measures will not work. Solomon emphasized this when he said, keep your heart 
with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Proverbs 4 and verse 23. So our behavior must be an expression of what we believe. God's principles of morality and holiness must become firmly entrenched in our minds. And then we will be able to express ourselves in a godly manner if we first have thought of the rightness and wrongness of various actions and have made up our mind how we will react in various situations that we might face. The Christian must constantly remind himself of God's teachings, be thoroughly saturated with the word. Observing them brings life and health to those who do so. Guarding one's heart will result in speaking and listening to the truth, which presumes that we have, by the way, the analytical ability to comprehend truth. Our eyes should be focused on the word and not distracted by the visual and verbal assaults that Satan uh, makes available to us. We know that the paths of righteousness and the broad way leads to destruction. We cannot allow our feet to travel where evil lies. And that includes companions. He who walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13, 24. Even under other covenants, people have recognized these truths. Joseph guarded his heart from the prospect of adultery. Daniel and his three friends would not violate their consciences by eating food that was forbidden to them. We must be as steadfast in our resolve to follow the truth. It's lamentable that with so much Bible to teach our youth that so many congregations seem to be wasting their time in, in Bible classes. Now, topical and thematic studies have their place, but students of the Word need to know the Bible, all of the Bible, how it fits together, and what morality entails. If young people, not to mention adults, are to secure their hearts, the knowledge must be present as well as the will in order to keep it. Understanding can only come from that holy book which teaches us to seek and obey God with a whole heart. We will now break for about 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll go with our next two lectures.